Good day, everyone. Today I'm going to speak to you about aromatic heterocycles and nucleophilic aromatic substitution. Okay, uh, first off, we're going to kind of distinguish uh, the differences between pyridine and pyrrole. Um, the difference between one and two carbon or five carbons and four carbons is actually quite significant uh, in terms of reactivity. Okay, um, <clears throat> first off, um, let's go over the lone pairs. So about nitrogen, there is, for pyridine, there is a lone pair that sticks out and is sp2. Okay. Uh, whereas the lone pair for pyrrole is actually going to be part of um, the pi system. And if you recall, uh, 4n plus 2. Um, so where n is equal to 1, so you have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 pi electrons. So remember that only one lone pair uh, can participate in um, the pi system to um, make up an aromatic structure. Okay, So somewhere in between these two, uh, in terms of reactivity, is where benzene lies. Okay, So benzene is here, where... Pyridine is going to be least reactive, and pyrrole is going to be most reactive. So sitting in there in the middle is benzene. Okay, so at this point you should be quite familiar with benzene. Okay. Now, uh, if we we're talking about electrophilic aromatic substitution, we uh, say for pyridine, I'm going to do pyridine first. So I'm going to put an electrophile about the 2 position and about the 3 position. So first step. So 2 and 3 position with respect to the nitrogen being the 1 position. Okay, so just picks up E plus, right? Okay. So we're going to have a side-by-side -side comparison here. So this is at the three position above. Okay. <clears throat> and then we're going to have it at the two position. The bottom. All right, <clears throat> so before we proceed with the uh, aromatic substitution mechanism, we're going to go over some of the different types of uh, sigma complexes that could be formed or where the positive charge is going to migrate around the uranium compound, or sorry, the inner uh, uranium ion. Okay, so um, as before, just with let's say benzene with its uh, sigma complex intermediate. This sp3 carbon is pretty much the dead end and where this um, charge can uh, migrate. So remember that, you know, which with each uh, pi electron flip, you're going to go to uh, nuclei uh, in position to where that um, charge migrates. Okay, so in other words, it's going to flip over here and then it's going to flip down here. Okay, so we're going to um, do those resonance structures. Oops. So then to satisfy the octet of that uh, positively charged nitrogen, i.e. carbocation site, we're going to run into a dilemma here. And the dilemma is, is that 
positive charges now about that nitrogen. Okay. So that means there's going to be a sextet as opposed to an octet around that nitrogen. Nitrogen is more electronegative than carbon. So this is really um, a very weak resonance contributor and uh, will not be likely. Okay, so in other words, you're really more or less relegated to two uh, forms of that arenium ion, okay? Versus um, if you were to do some electron uh, pushing over here, where the electrophile is amended to the three position, Now we have a total of three uranium ion forms okay so <clears throat> in essence we have three forms here beating out the two forms that are possible here. So in other words, this is going to be uh, more stable overall. Okay, so this is you, something you're not going to see so much. Okay, so that should explain why uh, generally pyridine has EAS, or electrophilic aromatic substitution, my little fancy acronym, at the three position. Okay, so pause for a second, then I'm gonna um, put a pyrrole here. Okay, so here's uh, the instance of pyrrole. So there are really only uh, the two or three positions. Um, you could choose four or five as well, but again, that's you're, we're looking for the lowest locator numbers with respect to where the nitrogen is uh, situated in the ring. Okay, so um, so picks up some generic electrophile. So here's up in the where it's uh, amended to the two position carbon. So uh, that positive charge is right there below it at the three position. Now um, notice that we can flip some electrons down And now we have the positive charge right there, adjacent to the nitrogen on the other end. Okay, so remember also that <clears throat> that lone pair participates in the pi um, system. So being a resonance contributor, now I'm gonna have Three different resonance structures. Okay. As opposed to down at the bottom at the three position where that electrophile has been added. Um, okay, so what's a big problem here is that the nitrogen can lend its, elect its lone pairs out to uh, fulfill that octet, and you'll get a full octet. But it's pretty much a dead end after that. Okay, so in other words, this pi bond or, uh, these pi bond electrons uh, right here are pretty much isolated from anything that can proceed forward. Because there will still be a full octet about that nitrogen, so you can't go beyond that. Okay, so it can't expand. So in other words, uh, again, these pi electrons are going to be kind of locked in place, if you will. positive charge okay so again you just have two forms as opposed to 
three up above at the two position. So um, the reactivity is different. Now this is going to be activated. This is going to be deactivated. The reason being, at least for electrophilic aromatic substitution, um, <clears throat> Okay, so again, pyrrole has uh, electrophilic aromatic substitution at the two position. Again, this uh, ion is more stable than this, um, not iridium ion, but this ionic form. Okay, so again, more resonant structures, uh, more stability. Okay, so this is going to be uh, activated because that nitrogen is dumping that lone pair into that pi system um, to... Um, have some means of charge separation, right, and have electrons reach out, as opposed to pyridine, where you already have um, six pi electrons around that circuit, right? But remember, under uh, electrophilic aromatic substitution conditions, typically things are going to be pretty acidic. So, in other words, um, this weekly basic nitrogen that's right here is going to pick up um, H plus pretty readily. So if you were to, let's say, have a conjugate acid form right here, that's stabilized by some kind of counter ion, right? Some uh, negatively charged species. Uh, this is going to deactivate the ring, okay? The reason being is because these lone, or sorry, these um, pi bonds are going to be disrupted in terms of resonance it's still going to be an aromatic uh heterocycle however uh because you're still going to have those six pi electrons but the problem is is that this nitrogen is going to sort of be uh, an intention hog and want those electrons uh kind of gravitating towards it since it's positively charged and needs to stabilize okay so that's really the difference among the two species here between pyridine and pyrrole Okay, so I'm going to go over 23.68, um, <clears throat> just examples A and B here. Uh, D, you can try to work out on your own. Um, sort of a conceptual question to think about there. Um, but A and B, so we're comparing, so these are bicyclic structures. So in other words, um, they've, they're have fused rings, if you will. Okay, um, now... Notice how example A, there is no catalyst needed. So in other words, we have a ring that's already activated. Which one of these two is going to be more uh, reactive? Well, the pyrrole. Remember that the pyrrole ring is going to be more activated than the uh, benzene ring. So even if they're fused, you still have to think in terms of electronics and what is going to be more activated. So in this case... Um, Remember, there's going to be, let's say, some kind of instantaneous dipole, right? So, we'll say this is partial positive, this is partial negative. It's going to kick that bromo group off. So, I'm going to do just a little bit of a refresher in terms of... Um, ...mechanisms, right? Because right now, I'm trying to get you guys in the habit of um, predicting what's happening mechanistically, but generally trying to ascertain that, in fact, you know, this is all going to be um, transformations, right? Okay, so we have... Um, BR tugging electron density away from this positive charge, making this hydrogen more um, acidic, right? We um, have this positive charge also stabilized by uh, via conjugation. Okay. Now, where is um, what's to occur? 
Wouldn't that be our minus? Which isn't going to pick up that hydrogen in quite an abundance, but remember that that hydrogen is going to be pretty acidic from, um, you know, a few things tugging electron density away from where that hydrogen is. So you're going to have, again, uh, substitution there at the two position and you won't need, let's say, uh, FeBr3 as a uh, catalyst to drive the reaction forward. Okay, so what's not going to happen is that the benzene ring isn't going to be substituted again because this pyrrole ring on the other side is going to be much more activated. So there's your BR. Okay, so that's the transformation. On to B. Okay, so which of these two is going to be more reactive? It's actually going to be uh, the the uh, benzene ring to the left that's fused on. Okay, so uh, if you recall mechanisms from previous chapter, you're gonna have coordination first from electron rich to electron poor. So again, these three bromo groups are tugging electrons away from um, that iron center. Okay, and then you're going to have um, heterolysis, right, because one of these is going to be positively charged. So this is going to act as a leaving group. Then you're going to have <clears throat> Br+, plus, which is going to be a strong electrophile. And where is it going to occur around about this ring? This particular ring. Right? It's actually going to occur right here. So let's put the BR plus right here. Okay. It's not going to occur at that particular junction, right? Um, because, oh, let's see why. Nitrogen right here, lone pair right here, double bond right here, double bond right here. Okay, so that positive charge is going to be resonant stabilized by that lone pair. Okay, so that's why you're going to see um, that uh, particular substitution right, not at the uh, ring junction or where things are uh, fused together, but rather right there. Okay, so some kind of creature is going to act as a base here, pull these electrons off, and then aromaticity is going to be reestablished. Okay, so here's your substituted product. And again, um, pyridine is not going to be as activated as just a benzene phenyl ring, whatever you want to call it. All right, so that's the comparison. Uh, take a look at D for your own edification. We can go over it during office hours. So. going to be this creature right here. Okay, so remember that um, for a pyridine, it's going to activate things at the three position. And where things are three position right here, they're both uh, in the way of one another. So there's another site 
uh, that actually use activated. So something for you to think about. Okay, so we're going to get into uh, nucleophilic aromatic substitutions. This is going to be a little bit different than what you've seen uh, classically with electrophilic aromatic substitution. And that there has to be some kind of species that goes amends onto the ring. Um, <clears throat> so that means there needs to be some addition step. Now, um, there's going to be an elimination also kind of tied into this. So it's not like what you typically see with uh, electrophilic aromatic substitution where you know there's something that's basic that takes that hydrogen away and um, facilitates that particular substitution where the hydrogen was. Furthermore, there's not a hydrogen that's being substituted. In this case, it's going to be a good leaving group, i.e. a chloro group, etc., some of those classic um, halides that you can think of. So <clears throat> uh, the first of two, so in most things in chemistry, things are very literal, right? So in this case, it's going to be an elimination addition mechanism. So again, elimination first followed by addition. So if we take, let's say, chlorobenzene here, this hydrogen and treat this with let's say Na NH2 as a conjugate base of um, ammonia. We're going to pluck this guy off. Okay, and it's going to boot off that chlorine. So that's the elimination step, right? Now What's on the right here is a very ring-strained uh, benzyne intermediate. So this is benzyne. That's something you're going to, you know, store in a bottle, right? So it's going to be a highly reactive intermediate because you have a pi bond that's actually going to be perpendicular to this whole pi system here, right? So uh, what that's going to do is actually reach out, at, or sorry, um, some other species is going to come around and attack and kick a pair of electrons out. And of course, those electrons are going to be strongly basic. Right. Strongly basic there. So uh, they're just going to pick up a hydrogen, I'll say it will, from another, um, or that original NH3 that we formed, right? So conjugate acid of uh, NH2 there is going to be serving as a, uh, an acid for protonating that ring. And so there you get... A nucleophilic aromatic substitution. So addition is going to happen right there from the electron rich to also electron rich species. <clears throat> but um, remember that you know two of these pi electrons are going to be uh, part of the system here. Okay. So we have, sorry, didn't actually put my substituted substituent there. Okay, so chloro's left, right? So chlorine's going to probably pair up with uh, sodium and form a, um, a salt that way. Okay, so uh, addition elimination, which is the opposite order as you would expect. Um, there's going to be some kind of, uh, so this is an SP intermediate, right? This is going to be actually an SP3 intermediate. So let's say we take, um, let's take an example here from your text. Mm -hmm. Let me go 
great if I found a good one. Okay. So we have these here. Two nitro groups that are meta to one another. But ortho and para with respect to, say, this chloro group right here. Okay. And we treat this with say KO um, conjugate base of ethanol. Okay, so this is going to be a good nuke. It's going to amend to that chloro group. What that's going to do is actually kick these electrons up onto the next carbon. Okay, so we have, I guess, sort of a sigma complex again. You could push the electrons all the way down here as well. Okay, but real the really the lesson uh, to be learned here is that the there needs to be electron withdrawing groups, either uh, either ortho and or para with respect to the substitution site. That's particularly important because it's going to, these electrons can resonate back with that um, nitro group and uh, you know, basically swing back down and boot off this chloro. So um, I'm not going to show the interaction with the NO2, right? But if you threw these electrons back into the pi system, what is that going to do? It's going to boot out the better leaving group, which is going to be the chlorine. Or the chloro. So, in other words, this is the transformation you're going to get. Okay. So, once again, um, <clears throat> just to drive it home, you need to have a good leaving group. That is again um, ortho and or para to <clears throat> some electron withdrawing groups. So EWGs. Okay. You need to have a strong base that's going to attack. Okay, or a good nucleophile in this case. So that's where you see a substitution occur. So <clears throat> there's, again, some sp3 intermediate. That uh, lone pair of electrons comes back down, cascades, and kicks off that chloro group, and then you have that substitution. Okay, so Cl minus goes down. Okay. So that's really the difference between the two. Again, it's fa fairly literal addition elimination. So addition first then elimination, elimination first, then addition. There you go. All right, so the exercise here for 23.78 <clears throat> is simply a um, sort of a guess as to what the, how you would form these particular products. Okay, so um, notice how there's an electron withdrawing group. Um, para to where there's an electron donating group, right? So in other words, something that acted as a nucleophile. In this case, you could kind of sever that bond so that this bond 
So one thing, uh, one particular strategy uh, related to this course to think about is retrosynthetic analysis. So kind of uh, having a disconnection approach in terms of what uh, got established for your target and where to work backwards. Okay, so, um, and of course for 23.78 on page uh, 1194, that's the um, particular example where they're asking you, you know, what kind of um, nucleophilic aromatic substitution uh, starting material you would use along with the conditions. So for B, you have to have something here that's going to be a leaving group, just like you would have for right here. So you could have a chloro group or fluoro group or something of that nature. So some kind of halide leaving group here. And so you have these two ketones. One's going to be uh, para and one's going to be meta. So we'll just put chloro right there. Okay, so uh, this strong nucleophile is going to amend right there and kick some electrons over to where um, they're essentially going to kick these electrons out. So I'll, I'll kind of draw this first mechanism for you here. negative charge okay so that intermediate is going to look like this hopefully it's not too jumbled up here So remember, there's that sp3 intermediate from the addition, right? So just uh, just like you'll see later on in the um, course in the next uh, module specifically, that um, you're going to see where addition takes place, nucleophilic addition, and what that is going to facilitate is um, an sp3 product okay now uh, back to concept at hand here so this negative charge is hanging around that oxygen now it has to cascade back right so electrons are being pushed over and then that cl group gets kicked off so that's going to lead you to, I'm going to just shift over the uh, electrons a little bit here instead of how they were drawn before to lead you to this particular product. Okay. So again, um, the attack occurs, the addition step occurs, and then these electrons basically shift over to where this electron withdrawing group is, hence why it's important to have that electron withdrawing group. That negative charge uh, about that oxygen is stable, but then uh, remember this is um, disrupting aromaticity or um, that pi structure. So uh, in the event these electrons come back down, push these other electrons over, these other pi electrons, to kick off uh, a better leaving group, which is gonna be Cl. Okay, now for um, example C, so again, the disconnection here is where that OH is. So in other words, that's where this um, uh, OH from NaOH um, act as, acts as a nuke, right? So again, nucleophilic aromatic substitution, so it's gonna attack 
at the position that is para to the electron withdrawing group. Okay, so um, OH, again, as you know, now, now know, uh, is a powerful nuke. So kick these electrons around. Uh, let me redraw this. day out there okay so with this electron push pushes these two electrons over pi electrons out so you're gonna have two negative charges and a positive charge about that nitrogen so what that's gonna look like I'll draw that because over here is the intermediate so you can see it okay so Again, leaving group here, about an sp3 intermediate carbon. Nitrogen that's positively charged. Okay, two oxygens that are negatively charged. And spasm for cat. Okay, so then this negative charge comes back down like so, kicks these guys off, pushes these electrons out, and then kicks the chloro group off. And there's your product. Okay. Let me redraw that so it's not so jumbled here. Do a little too close for comfort. Okay, so the second step with HCl, remember you're going to be under basic conditions. So that um, hydroxyl group that forms is actually going to be fairly acidic, at least with respect to a basic environment. Okay. So Again, this might be loss of your under uh, basic conditions, so you basically uh, drop the pH and then uh, your organic product will form. Okay, so the next few problems um, I'm going to go over with you just to round out the chapter, seeing as this is going to be um, sort of more a synthetic approach, it's going to cover uh, pretty much everything that's in this juggernaut of a chapter, chapter 23. Um, so what we're going to need to do is place uh, an amino group as well as this ketone uh, pair to one another. So notice that one is meta-directing and this one is ortho directing So the best uh, approach is to add the amino group first. Right, because meta is pretty um, uh, pretty limiting in terms of where you can place things. Also, remember that uh, this is going to be deactivating relative to the amino group. Okay, so the first step um, to do amination um, is to nitrate. So we'll just use... H3NO, or sorry, HNO3 and H2SO4. Okay, so the first step is nitration. Okay, now there's a nitro group there. That can be reduced to a um, amine for the second step. So now it's NH2 instead of NO2. All 
Okay, so here's where the additional steps come in. The problem is, is that if we're going to fuse this particular uh, ketone or acyl group onto the ring, uh, the problem lies in here is remember that this is going to be nucleophilic as well. And in fact, it's probably going to be more nucleophilic than uh, anything on the ring here, right? Although that these pilect or sorry these lone pairs can kind of feed into the ring a little bit and activate the ring, um, this is actually going to be um, slightly smaller. The nitrogen is going to be slightly smaller than the carbons, so it's going to want to uh, you know disperse that uh, electron, you know. Uh, richness to other species, especially something like an acillium ion, right? So if you recall, an acillium ion is just like so, right? So there's a full octet everywhere. So in this case, it's this is this particular acillium ion, one, two, three, uh, one, two, three. Okay, so cross this one off. Okay, so this particular carbon is what's going to react, right? Because it's activated by this positive charge about the oxygen pulling electrons up. Okay, so this is gonna be, uh, that particular carbon is gonna be electrophilic. Okay, so um, the next step here is to introduce an, uh, an acetyl agent. So this is uh, acetic anhydride in the presence of pyridine. So pyridine is going to act as a weak base when this attacks, okay? So this is what is going to be referred to as a protective group, which I'll get into later on in the semester. Sorry, some of this stuff in the in the text is sort of like cart before the horse. Um, unfortunately, if you're trying to follow things from a linear uh, progression in this book, some some stuff that is really important in NMR is, you know, in chapter 14 and then in chapters 22 and 23, at least with respect to how to best understand um, aromatic structures. Anyway, um, sorry about my little side rant there, but what this is going to do is isolate um, that uh, amino group to make it a secondary amide. And what this particular pyridine is going to do is it's not going to act as a nucleophile. It's just going to act as a weak base. So one of these hydrogens has to go. Okay. All right, so now that that's protected, this ring is still activated, remember, because you have a lone pair that can either come down or resonate up. So um, it's better than having a good nucleophile because this is not going to be a good nucleophile. This is, right? So now you can do your friedel crafts acylation, Al, Cl3, and then your acid chloride. So this is going to go para because this is a little bit too bulky. So this kind of works in a two-fold uh, manner. One, protective group. Two, um, it's going to force things to uh, have a para um, substitution as opposed to uh, ortho. Okay, so now we have our para... Synthetic intermediate. Okay. So the last step here is hydrolysis. So acid in the presence of heat is going to strip this off. So it's essentially working backwards from what you saw here. Um, 
this hydrogen uh, from H3O is going to um, activate this ketone. And then that water is actually going to amend and kick off this as a leaving group. Okay, and then, of course, this is going to be um, acidified. Okay, so, in other words, okay, so you're going to have um, acetic acid is something that gets stripped off there. Okay, so that's how you get from A to B, C, D, E, F, A to F. All right, so again, this is just um, um, example E that I've gone over in 2380. So I'm going to go over a couple more with you. Just uh, pause and sit tight. Okay, so there's a, here's a tale of two compounds. Uh, so we're starting off with the same substrate, this isopropyl um, benzene ring that's, that's here. Again, 23.82 is going to be on the top of page 1195. Um, <clears throat> okay, so the first thing uh, to notice here is that you have a carboxylic acid here um, on both ends. You have isomers of one another, at least constitutional isomers. So one is going to be para, one is going to be meta. So that means that um, one chlorination needs to be meta-directed, the other it needs to be para. Um, now remember that chloro is going to be ortho directing. Carboxylic acid is going to be meta-directing. Okay. Now, uh, again, you see a meta uh, relationship here. You see a para relationship here. So uh, the take home here is which order are you going to do things? Because you're going to end up with the same um, substituents. You just need to um, change up the order, essentially. So how are you going to get from an isopropyl group to um, a carboxylic acid? You're going to use KMnO4, which is an oxidizing agent, a strong one at that, in the presence of NaOH. Okay, so it's going to be highly basic. And then the second step, you're just going to acidify. The reason being is that if you didn't acidify, this is going to be and it's conjugate base form. Remember, you're going to be using with NA, dealing with NaOH under strongly basic conditions. So um, effectively, KMnO4 is going to form a pericyclic intermediate and oxidize this carbon to the point where it's uh, twice oxidized and you're going to get um, a carboxylate. And then the second step is you're just going to acidify again to get that hydrogen. So the next step following that, remember since this is going to be meta-directing, you're going to treat this with chlorine as well as aluminum chloride. Okay, so this is going to be a strong, um, this is going to be a strong catalyst to generate that uh, Cl plus that can be a good electrophile. Okay. Now, uh, for the second step, or sorry, for the second reaction, so you're home free there on the top for A. For B, the first thing you wanna do is, since this is gonna be ortho para directing as well, it's a little bit too bulky to drive things in the ortho position, so instead, they're gonna pop over there meta. Okay, so aluminum trichloride, and that's going to form this kind of intermediate here. Okay, so again, para, I'll put the first inter synthetic intermediate for A here, so just so you guys know what I'm talking about. So this is going to be benzoic acid for the 
first step. So if I were to put that right there in the middle between those two reactions. Okay, so this is gonna go here in the middle. Then the next step, again, oxidizing with a strong oxidizing agent. It's gonna go two stages. So it's gonna go from um, that uh, methine carbon to our carboxylic acid. Again, um, with the acid or acidification step on the second step. Okay, and then you're just going to get your para product as intended. Again, this is already para, so it's just this carbon right there that's getting oxidized. Word of note with KMNO4 is that if you have a quaternary carbon that's directly attached to this ring right here, It's not going to work, okay? So you need at least one hydrogen here in order to initiate everything. So just a word of caution there with that particular synthetic trap. All right. All right, um, and I think we can go over um, the last example during office hours, 23.94. Uh, so there are going to be nine steps in total. Uh, trying to produce aspirin from benzene. So t see if you can uh, try to work that out on your own. Uh, just understand that there's going to be a protective group or two there. Um, you can look at some of those uh, in Chapter 19 for protective groups. In the meantime, uh, be safe out there. Have a good one and uh, try not to get too bored. <laughs> All right, take it easy.